Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Bloomberg Invest. And thank you. Thank you. And of course, Admiral Rogers. Uh, you really don't need an introduction, but for those that are maybe not up to speed on his entire CV, nearly 40 years um, in the Navy, he is a four-star admiral. And Was. I'm... Well, he's still an admiral in our eyes. <laughs> Um, of course, you ran CENTCOM Cybersecurity. I ran Cyber Command. Cyber Command, and of course, Director of the National Security Agency. Um, so you've been at the forefront of national security, geopolitical issues for decades. Given what we're seeing now, whether or not it's Russia, whether or not it's tensions with China, whether or not it's this status quo, what's going to happen in the next few years with the U.S. relationship with Tehran? How important are geopolitical matters to the global investment community? The, the bottom line is very important. My argument would be if you look at the world around you, you're seeing the role of government is significantly expanding. Most governments around the world feeling that, hey, they need to take a more aggressive regulatory position. They need to be more involved in inserting themselves broadly and just not national security, but economic activity. Secondly, the definition of national security is really expanding. And there's a huge economic dimension to this now that had always been a factor, but I would argue it's become even greater. Um, there is a significant challenge in terms of the rate of change and the complexity of that change. If, if you want to see an example of that, you just look at the Russians invade Ukraine for the first time in February of 2014 when they invade what is Crimea almost zero business community reaction in the sense that the dynamic at the time, that's a national security issue, that's not a business issue. Fast forward eight years, February of 22, and the Russians invade the broader part of Ukraine and look at how the business community reacted. Totally different dynamic. And I just think increasingly now- And on their own accord, they right, weren't pushed They weren't by the pushed, government. because remember, that wasn't even part of government strategy. It was, we're gonna use sanctions. Um, so I think it just highlights there's a need for the business world to have a, a, an ever greater understanding of the broader dynamics of the world around them over and above the economic factors that often shaped an investment criteria. When you look at what happened with Russia, I guess first comes to mind is what lessons have been learned. We're now more than a year into this war. Yeah, 16 months into a conflict that most people, to include the Russians, thought would last less than two weeks. Yeah, some people said it was going to be days or hours <clears throat> before Putin controlled Kiev. But... What have we learned with the Russia conflict that potentially the U.S. may try to use similar levers when it comes to China? You talk about how all these companies and multinationals immediately withdrew from Russia. Would the same be true of China? Because the relationship between the business community in the United States and China is much more Right, so th th the China dynamic is a totally different scenario. And, you know, the strategy and what um, the initial approach was with respect to the Russia-Ukraine dynamic I suspect would be very different. It would clearly, I think, be much more difficult to generate, oh, thank you very much, sir. It'd be very much more difficult to generate a broad global economic international consensus about what kinds of specific activities. What I think you learned from the Russia-Ukraine scenario is number one, the power of a, a multinational approach, that the ability to bring together multiple nations, if you will, to agree on a framework of action, very powerful, sends a very powerful message both to the Ukrainians in terms of global support, but also to the Russians in the term, in the sense of, you're, we're not gonna just wait this out. Um, I think secondly, you also get a feel for the dynamic of how warfare is changing and how the commercial and civil world is being much more integrated into conflict. You look at what commercial space, what commercial technologies are providing every day to the conflict in Ukraine. Um, you know, the idea is that conflict is an inherently governmental or military dynamic and that the corporate world or the commercial sector in, has it, it, I think this conflict also shows you that look there are limitations to options we're 16 months into a sanctions regime and I, I think if we're honest it has not yet doesn't mean it won't but for right now it has not achieved the desired effect of creating enough pain that it leads Putin to decide I need to change my calculus um, it just hasn't had that impact, so there are limitations. Right. They've been tough to sanctions, but they haven't been the knockout Correct. that many were. Yeah, I think that's a fair characterization. So what, I, one other thought before I forget? Yeah, of course. One of the things I hope that China in particular takes away from this is they look at it and they assess this situation is 
you know, look, the military, the use of military force should always be viewed in a perfect world as the last option. And one of the reasons for that is what this conflict shows you is, in my experience, conflict is seldom as simple and as orderly as you often think it might be. So one of the things I would try to remind any nation would be, look, if you go down this road of military force, you're going to rapidly lose the level of control you think you're going to have. And it likely is going to be not as clean as you think it will. And there's going to be second and third order effects that you didn't account for. I just hope that's one of the takeaways from all this. I want to get to more of how China's viewing this and potentially how they view exactly. um, their control and potential military plans when it comes to Taiwan. But at the moment... Who's ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> at the moment, when it comes to Russia, we're in the middle or on the cusp of, I would say, a counteroffensive. Um, where's the path for this to end, given... I think most of the sanctions the U.S. wants to levy on Putin have already been used. Uh, there's not much more they can do unless they did an outright ban of some commodities instead of using the price cap. Jack. So broadly, conflicts historically have tended to end for either one of three or a combination of the three. One, one side achieves a level of military supremacy on the battlefield that leads either them or the other to feel, we need to stop. The second scenario tends to be a political dynamic. Hey, there's political pressure either on one of the combatants that leads them to believe, I just need to stop this. Politically, I can't sustain it. And the third, if you just look historically, is some external party. It might be the United Nations. Historically, it might have been a, a nation that was supporting one of the primary combatants. A third party steps in and applies enough pressure and leverage to say, hey, look, we just have to stop this. If you look at this conflict, we're 16 months into this. None of those three scenarios look like they apply right now. Neither side has achieved enough of a decisive military impact to lead to a, a military pressure. Neither side has really significant political Russia, Ukraine. Neither has significant political pressure to end this from their own populations. And thirdly, none of the outside, I would argue China for Russia, mm -hmm. EU, US, NATO uh, for Ukraine, neither of those parties are pressuring the primary combatants to end this. Um, given that, my comment, and I've been saying this you know, for about a year now, I don't see this ending time soon, anytime soon, unless you change one of those dynamics. You put enough military capacity in the hands of the parties that they can achieve a decisive battlefield effect. You somehow create enough political pressure to lead them to believe we have to change the conflict, or you're that external party that steps in and says, look, we just can't keep writing a blank check here. You have to come with a way to end this. Because if we're not careful, this either becomes the conflict that doesn't end or it becomes a frozen conflict. I mean, if you just look at the situation in Korea, for example, a reminder, we're in an armistice. That conflict has never officially ended. It's the most heavily fortified border in the world. And there are literally you know, hundreds of thousands of troops and it's the most heavily fortified border area in the world. And that condition has been in place for 70 years. Right, or it becomes a forever war. I right. mean, before all of... I mean, a conflict that doesn't... And before all of this, end. there was fighting in eastern Ukraine since yeah. 2014. So maybe just that continues as a war of attrition. You look at the political polarization, though, lots of debate in Washington, where I'm currently based, about how much money they should continue to spend, uh, send to Ukraine. The administration, though, has taken this approach where they almost drag their feet and then they come to giving the Ukrainians everything they're asking for, the latest being the F-16s. What else could they need or be useful for them on the well, ground? Well, if you just look at publicly what the Ukraine government and the, their military has talked about, give us weapons with longer range strikes so we can, if you will, apply force at greater distances inside Russia, potentially itself. They've asked, give us increased air defense capabilities. Look what the Russians are doing with respect to drones, aircraft and missile strikes, um, and cruise missile strikes. Um, they've also talked about, hey, look, if you can give us more capability to increase our situational awareness of what's going on on the battlefield. The challenge that we're in right now, and again, this is just Mike Rogers' opinion, so you take it for what it's worth. Admiral Rogers. We're, we're in incremental warfare right now. What I mean by that is we slowly ratchet up. Now, we are not, for example, if you go back to our initial statements, we, the United States, our initial statements in terms of our characterization of the conflict and what we were comfortable with in terms of providing support, 
we're not providing things that when this conflict started, we initially said- Ruled out, red lines. We're not gonna do this. Um, it just shows you that we're kind of in this incremental. The challenge with an incremental approach to me is it, it tends not to provide enough that you fundamentally change the dynamic. And when you, fund, when you don't fundamentally change the dynamic, you get the scenario where we're in now where neither side seems to have enough capacity or capability to deliver a knockout blow. A knockout blow being defined as enough battlefield success that it leads to the leadership on either side saying, you know, we have just got to stop this. We've got to end it. We're just not there. So if you're Xi Jinping and, and you're watching this and you've pretty much turned Russia into your penal colony. Um, I've never heard that phrase used before. I think it was a Russian official who actually commented about it mm. to the Financial Times. Um, how do you view what's happening? You see this multilateral approach. Then you also see the Biden administration taking a similar multilateral approach when it comes to China, not in terms of exact confrontation, but export controls and some of these penalties deeply linked into the business community. And for the most part, there's been some geopolitical rifts, obviously, or rifts between the allies, Emmanuel Macron going to China and kind of stating a new policy for Europe. That Our French friends. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't exactly on board what I think the administration had. But the administration did have a win, and I was with the president at the G7. They're not calling it a deep coupling, but they're calling it a de risk. A de risk. Yeah. So if you're in the business community and you see all this rhetoric that's very hot and tense at the moment between Beijing and Washington, yet trade is still at record levels, how do you think about this potential conflict, um, either China making a move on Taiwan or more sanctions against China, and position for that? So look, I think each leader, our president, Xi in Beijing, has tried to communicate, look, we do not want this to get out of control. We don't want to drive this into armed conflict. So in some ways, to me, they're trying to set a floor. Hey, we don't want this to get any worse than this. Um, the, the challenge, so the positive side is neither side wants a military conflict. As a result of that, much of, particularly from a U.S. perspective, while, there's a, where's it, while there is a defense component to our strategy, the most visible, I would argue the most immediate, has tended to be in the economic side, whether it is our, the things we're doing on semiconductors and technology, trade and tariff policy, um, interesting discussions on for the business community, interesting discussions which have been talked about publicly about should we, the United States, look at reducing the flow of capital into China? Hey, is the that fueling, is that capital fueling the growth and the, their ability to do some things? Um, so there's a definite economic piece here. And, you know, at the moment, you've got a couple poster child in terms of Chinese businesses, Huawei being the most visible. And you've also seen out increasingly Michael. on a handful of U.S. businesses where now China is reacting to them. And in my experience right now, you're watching the business community try to understand, so what's the level of risk I'm dealing with here? What are the implications for me, both from a market, but also from a reputational dimension? Um, should I double down on what I'm doing? Should I take the status quo, sustain my focus, sustain my investment, but perhaps not re-up it? Or do you say to yourself, given the political dynamic combined with some of the supply chain challenges of the last three years, hey, maybe I look, I need to look at de-risking, if you will, my supply chain, so I need supply chain vulnerability and dependency mitigation, so I need to look at shifting some of those components. Elsewhere, arguably Vietnam and India, probably the most visible, um, and Singapore to, to, in some ways. And that's been encouraged as well by the U.S. Right, government. The most visible dimensions of this idea of, hey, you gotta create more, more independence from a supply chain perspective. Um, this, this is a tough time for the business community. My input has always been, look, engage with the government, help the U.S. government understand what your concerns are and what the world looks like from your perspective. Because remember, that when you were in government, you wanted to understand the national security and the political dimensions, but you also wanted to understand the economic dimensions. And the knowledge and greatest expertise on the economic dimensions or in the marketplace, not necessarily in the institutions. Not, that's not a knock on them. I was a part of them, as you said, for almost you know, 40 years, most of my adult life. But I, I do think there's an important role for the business community to play here in ensuring the government understands the dynamics from a business perspective. You mentioned Huawei, uh, what's happening now with Micron Technologies. China is basically partially banning them. 
And immediately after this came out from Beijing, the Commerce Department came out and said, we are going to work to try to resolve this, and went after Beijing again for economic coercion. Do you see more than ever a growing partnership between U.S. businesses and the government? It, do U.S. businesses need the government to help them in places like China? At the same time, the government also needs U.S. businesses potentially, right? Because they're the ones I, that are going to be able to have the private investment to diversify supply chain. So partnership is a phrase that, uh, to me, it comes with some political implications that I would say, hey, that's too strong. What, what I would argue is, look, there clearly is a set of relationships between the private sector and government. It's true in China. It's true in the United States. It's true in almost every um, significant economy in the world. And as I said, as the definition of national security is expanding to very much include that economic dimension, and in some ways that economic dimension really coming to the fore, um, the importance of conversation and dialogue between government and the private sector is also going to become more and more important. It's one of the reasons why I had said previously, look, help the government understand your concerns. Don't assume that Washington has really in-depth expertise and knowledge of your particular market sector, whatever it might be, and help them understand this is what shapes the dynamic for us. This is what brings stability. This is what helps mitigate risk. These are the things that we're concerned about in terms of if we're going to make long-term commitments. These are the things we're looking for. How concerned are you with what we saw, say, last weekend with a Chinese vessel coming very close to a U.S. warship in the Taiwan Strait? At the same time, you have Li Shang-Fu, the Chinese defense minister, at an event with Lloyd Austin. Yeah, and the Shangri-La Dialogue. Yeah. yeah, and they didn't sit down for each other. They just had, uh, with each other, excuse me, they just had this casual, um, cordial handshake. That's all it was. And they went back up on the stage and traded barbs with each other, so much that Li Shang-Fu said, when you come to China and you're friends, we welcome you with wine. When you come as an enemy, we have shotguns. Um, how concerning is that kind of rhetoric it's from good, the biggest it's economies a good challenge in the world? For where the dynamic is yeah, it, they're the biggest it? economies in the world, and these are the two military chiefs, and they cannot even sit in a room together. So, look, at first, as a mariner, I, I started as a ship driver in the United States Navy. Before I got into intelligence and cyber, I was driving destroyers around some of the oceans of the world. And when I first saw this, I thought, a surface contact passing in front of you at 150 yards, wow, guys, this is dangerous. Ships are slow moving. It takes a lot of time to change course, to get out of trouble. You intentionally, as a mariner, you constantly want to make sure that you have time and space so you actually have decision-making. This is an intentional making. provocation. Oh, yes, this, this was intentional. Um, so that concerns me. The same with what you saw in the air. And sadly, we have seen in the air, back in April of 2001, when a Chinese fighter aircraft maneuvered aggressively um, and lost a little bit of control and situational awareness and ended up impacting the, the, the wing of an airborne reconnaissance aircraft from the United States that was operating in operating international airspace. Chinese fighter crashes, Chinese pilot dies, sadly. U.S. aircraft damage declares an emergency and aborts to Hainan Island in southern China and lands, then we get into this entire challenge about how do we get the crew released, how do we get the aircraft back. This is not a road that we want to go down. And one of the things that we always, just speaking as Mike Rogers, not for the U.S. government, one of the things we always try to say to our Chinese counterparts, because at one point in my career I was the senior intelligence individual in DOD out in the theater. I was the director of intelligence for what was then U.S. Pacific Command, what is now U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. And one of the things we always tried to say to our Chinese counterparts was, even in the height of the Cold War, when we were being very aggressive with each other, my first destroyer was rammed by a, <laughs> by a Russian combatant in the Black Sea off Sevastopol in the late 1980s. Um, so I, I've seen this aggressive behavior before out at sea. What we tried to tell our Chinese counterparts was, even in the midst of all that, we got together every year. One year it would be in Moscow, the other year it would be in Washington. And we met as leaders within the respective militaries to say, look, we need to develop mechanisms so we can communicate with each other, we can actually signal at sea to each other, so we can try to mitigate... Rules of engagement. The, right, the uh, rules of interaction. This is a little different. R rules of interaction about, hey, how do we diffuse these aggressive acts from escalating to the point where they get out of control and we lead to potential loss of life, damage to units, and potential loss of units? And we would say to the Chinese, look, there's a model there. Can't we come up with a recurring dialogue with you? 
And they, they just broadly were not receptive and felt, no, that's not the model for us. The model for us is you need to stop engaging in activity in the environs around China. And our response was, we operate in the surface and in the air in international airspace and waters. And it is a foundational principle of international law that in, inner, that in those waters and airspace, you have the authority to operate. And we're not gonna cede that to any nation, not just China, any nation. Because at our view, the United States, that is not in the, world, the world's best interest. That's not the world we want. We want to be able to have a right of innocent passage where it might be a warship, it might be an, a merchant ship carrying you know, cargo to different places around the world. We want them to be able to go from point A to point B for innocent economic and you know, non-confrontational or conflict kinds of activities. That's a foundational issue for us in the U.S. Um, we just have a few moments left. I want to end with, obviously, China. End on a high. Yeah, end on <laughs> well, a high. I don't know. I know it's quite a depressing conversation. I'm sorry about that. Um, I did another geopolitical panel yesterday, and they said, well, this was really depressing, an hour of it. But if you're you know, an executive or portfolio manager and you're looking at this, obviously, the biggest geopolitical risk probably to you is going to be China. What is the most important part of this relationship that the business community needs to be looking out for? Clearly, the, the economic dimension between the two largest economies in the world, I, I think, is, is at the forefront of this. Like I said, when I was out in the Pacific, I was a military guy, and I would tell my boss, my four-star boss then, sir, if you, for example, if you want to under China, understand China, it's military and what it's doing, it is all about the economic, in, it's about the economics, it's about the party, and it's about the dynamics of Chinese society. If we understand those three things, that helps provide a context that helps us understand why are these Chinese military units doing these kinds of activities? Why are they making the investments in the military that they are? The last point I would make is, look, the relationship is not in a good place, and it's not where we want it to be. But the flip side is we continue to engage in economic activity. We continue to talk to each other, even if it is not at the level or with a frequency and certainly at the seniority that we would like Secretary to Secretary Blinken's going there. Right, that we would like to see. But as long as that continues, look, guys, there's hope here that we can work our way through it, even as I acknowledge it's not in a good place. And I don't see this dynamic fundamentally changing in the near term. I wish I could tell you, hey, two years, we're going to be in a very different place. I hope that's the case, but I doubt it. Admiral Mike Rogers, thank, thank you, you very so much. much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you all very much.